All right. Good evening, everyone. Today is Wednesday, January 31st, 2024. It is the last day of January. We made it. Uh, my name is Susie Robb, and I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Community and Economic Development Committee of the Bridgewater Town Council. I do note the presence of a quorum to conduct business tonight. With me, we have Fred Chase, District 3 Counselor, and uh, Brad McKinnon, Counselor at Large. We're going to commence the meeting as we do have a quorum present. Debbie, is this a good point to, uh, oh, Bob, are you all set in terms of co-hosting? Yeah. Okay, You're great. gonna read the governor's announcement. Yeah I, yeah, I was just going to say, I'm going to keep moving. I just wanted to make sure since she left. <laughs> um, I do want to read the covert disclosure statement. Um, pursuant to Section 20 of Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2020, an act relative to extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency and the March 31st, 2025 extension granted by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 this meeting for the town of Bridgewater will be fully remote and accessible to the public through remote participation to the greatest extent possible. No in-person attendance is permitted. Citizens who wish to tune into the meeting may do so via Zoom. Okay. So uh, we did our call to order. Um, item B, approval of meeting minutes. Uh, that was not included in the packet. So um, our last official CED meeting was November 2nd, um, and we did have a joint meeting um, uh, a few weeks back, but since they weren't included in the packet, I'm going to move on from that item. I'm gonna move on to um, item C, which is public comment. I see we do have members of the, of the public here. Would anyone like to speak? Um, if so, please raise your hand and um, please state your name, your address, and... Um, Please limit your comments to three minutes. Madam Chair, can I just make a clarification? Public comment is not is limited to something that's not on the agenda tonight. They can only speak about something that's not on the agenda. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you for that additional clarification. Okay. I see Mr. Carlton Hunt's hand. hand up. Yep. Go ahead, Mr. Hunt. Now, speaking to the energy code that you're going to talk tonight, if you have questions for me as any key committee chair, I'm more than happy to answer when you're in your discussions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, we uh, are going to move on to the next agenda item. We have some referred legislation. We have two items tonight. Uh, I'm going to start with item D A. Proposed Zoning Amendment Ordinance DFY24-004, Central Business District and Form-Based Code. This is an ordinance that is co-sponsored by our um, Council President, Eric Moore, and myself. Um, so let's begin discussion. First, I just, just want to check in. I know everyone has the agenda. Um, we also have um, some comments that have been provided to us by the uh, the planning board. And for Mr. Ruley, I just want to clarify, I know we had some uh, emails back and forth around um, the document versions. What's in the agenda, is that the same document, the red line document that you shared with, with me last night? I don't believe it is. Okay, which one is the, well, so we can only really go off the version that I believe is in the agenda. So I don't know that it makes a difference for this discussion. Um, I'm happy to, I can share my screen, but it, you know, there's 40 some odd pages, but I think I mean, my suggestion would, if you would allow me to speak, I'll just make a suggestion on how I think we should move forward. Sure. So the, uh, after the joint meeting, the planning board had their regular scheduled meeting in January and further discussed uh, the proposed amendment. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Driscoll on be and the planning board then subsequently voted four to one to offer a positive referral to the town council to adopt the zoning amendment and also made some recommendations that they would like to see included. 
Mr. Driscoll in his uh, letter on behalf of the planning board uh, to the town council, which you've been copied on, uh, articulated what those recommendations were from the planning board. A CD um, does not have any issue with most of the recommendations with the exception of the following, uh, that the recommendation that all approved housing units have 10% affordability and the recommendation that no building be over six stories. Um, and I'm happy to share what CED's rationale for both of those are, if you'd like, Madam Chair. Okay, before we get to that, I again just want to um, make sure that we're working off the correct documents. So the the version that's in the agenda is certainly what's been published. The document that you sent me last night that has um, text edits, is that a previous version to the one that was posted or is that a more current version? It's a more, more current version. Okay. Um, can you perhaps shed some highlights and then we can get into the specifics around um you know what was proposed from the planning board but can you walk us through a little bit in terms of yeah i think that for the most part um the most significant change was the language with respect to uh affordability and additional density um other than that there was really minor some scrivener errors that we caught some formatting um, there's additional formatting that has to happen, but the most substantive change was uh, removing the language and the formula that was in there with respect to public contributions. Uh, we don't have an active affordable housing trust fund as an example at this time. So to say that we were going to put money into that really didn't make any sense. So we've cleaned that up um, and you know, set forth that if in fact a project was approved for additional density and height over four stories, that there would be a requirement that 10% of those units be set aside as, as affordable. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just wanna, uh, are my fellow counselor, do, you all have that additional document from last night, correct? Yep. Okay. I think it would, um, I think it would make sense as we think about making sure that we're aligned on which version um you know before we go into the the february 6th meeting uh with the rest of our our colleagues so after this meeting tonight depending on what comes out of it i will have both a red line version of the original document and a cleaned up version of what is going to uh the council next tuesday both of those documents will be in your packets i have to have those to debbie tomorrow morning yeah okay good and okay. those will be posted. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, why don't we, yeah. So why don't we dig into some of the the specifics that were in the, um, the recommendations from the planning board? So uh, I'll start with the, the requirement for that all housing have a 10% of the units be affordable. And I don't want to get overly techno nerdy, but I think it's important because there are a number of reasons why that's a really bad idea. Uh, first of all, to have 10% in all projects being approved would throw us into the category of an inclusionary zoning, uh, which is not kind of goes against what the spirit of the form based code is. Um, secondly, there is no requirement in the MBTA communities legislation that any of the compliance housing be affordable. And then it also would make financing any of these housing projects, particularly the smaller ones, incredibly difficult to get financing for uh, because that affordable component is going to make it non-traditional, either construction funding or permanent funding. And it's also going to add additional cost to a developer because they're going to have a requirement to uh, hire a monitor to make sure that those units uh, remain affordable. The other part that I think is important to understand, and I've talked about this often in presentations that we've done, if in fact there is a requirement for affordability, the threshold for that is that that would be capped at somebody at 80% of area median income, 
which is 72,000 for a single individual in, in Bridgewater. Um, I'm not sure that that is necessarily in, you know, the other pieces you're considered housing challenged if you are paying more than 30% of your annual income towards housing. And based on proposed rents that we see at projects like uh, the Perkins Foundry, those rents are not exceeding 30%. So why the intention to say we're going to include an affordability component is sincere. It's not necessarily helping people that need assistance in housing. Um, as an example, the McCoy School is at 60% affordability, but it also has 15 layers of debt, a debt stack of 15 different lenders in order to accomplish that. And it took two years for them to put that together. And again, that, that's defeating the spirit of what the form-based code was in terms of trying to um, expedite projects that meet all the other requirements of the form-based code that are consistent with what we want to see. Um, now we're going to drag that out for an extended period of time as somebody is looking to try to put a financing package together. Um, so that's you know my position on the 10%. We do uh, have language within the form-based code that if somebody requested a density bonus in terms of height, something more than four stories, that there is an absolute requirement that 10% of the units in that building be affordable. Um, in reading the form-based code, there are only two likely sites and only one now where the six stories would be appropriate and that would be Campus Plaza. And that also requires a requirement that there be other buildings fronting that building. It's not that you would have a six story building as a standalone. Mm -hmm. The other potential location for six stories would be in the Spring Street lot, uh, which is owned by the MBTA, which we believe there's an opportunity when the platform is moved that the MBTA would entertain ground leasing a portion of that. Um, and if they're ground leasing it, they're going to look to get the maximum amount of revenue from that ground lease, which would suggest they'd want something with a little higher density, and that would be six stories. Um, you know, the form-based code specifically sets forth that in addition to having housing surround uh, any higher building, that the, the lot size be in excess of four acres. So we only have two logical sites where, where that could happen. Um, so my intent is to keep the language in the document the way that we originally drafted it. It ultimately will be the town council, your fellow colleagues as a whole, to decide whether they want to take the recommendation from the planning board, any recommendation that comes out of this committee, or they want to leave uh, the language intact as we've, we've drafted it. So um, hopefully that summarizes what our... CD position is on that issue. Thank, thank you, Bob. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I know that I've been in previous meetings. One of the one of the individuals who's definitely called that aspect out several times. I think one of the things I want to make sure that this group does understand, and I actually would love your perspective as well, Bob, is that you know, having attended several events where you spoke. Um, having read the, one of the white papers on housing that your team drafted and what's actually literally on the website that your team put together, there's there's a pretty strong statement um, that has been consistently messaged out into the community. So on the website, it says a key element of the vision to reality plan is utilizing MBTA communities legislation to amend existing zoning regulations which will allow for more flexibility in developing mixed income housing and attracting commercial tenants. So I, I hear what you're saying, and I know we've had a separate conversation as well around, it's not required, it's not mandated. We've already met our, our 40B requirements. So this really would just be in good spirit faith of trying to encourage mixed income housing. As we've talked about, you know, seniors are looking for options. There's professors from the university who say it's too expensive to live here. That has been a thread 
of a positive that we viewed around this potential development. Now, I understand what you're saying too, is that with the amended language, not the original, but the amended language that was requested, you know, around the um, density bonus, it does allow for it. But we now have a planning board who's opposed to six stories. So I just want it to be really, really clear for, for this CED committee that some of what's been messaged is not entirely going to be potentially fulfilled with this code. So it is a decision that we will make. And Can it I doesn't respond? mean that it's completely, you know, not going to happen at all. It just means that the way I think it was positioned so strongly may not really be delivered. If I could respond, Madam Chair. Sure. I I, I would be comfortable, and, and we're seeing this with the Perkins Foundry site, if you had a development that had over 100 units, say, that there'd be something written into the code saying those projects would also have an absolute requirement for 10% or a percentage that the council was comfortable with of affordability. If we, without the form-based code being in place, we negotiated that as part of the approval of the Perkins Foundry project. Um, so that project will have 10% set aside, deed restricted with a monitor for affordable units. So I think, you know, again, we only have really two sites that have the ability to have the kind of density that you see at the Perkins Foundry mm -hmm. uh, site. So I would not be uncomfortable adding language that sets a threshold if you're exceeding that number of units, that there be affordability uh, baked into that. But I would also say that in, in terms of uh, mixed income, when I'm looking at what the proposed rents are at the Perkins Foundry, um, that's, a, you know, some of that is people that are at 80% of area median income are going to be able to afford those rents and not be over the 30% uh, house burden threshold that the HUD has established. And that's assuming, you know, that it's a single individual. Um, I think most likely in these scenarios, we're either going to see young couples or two professionals that, you know, if some, if, if a household is making $150,000, um, they should be able to afford this. Um, the other piece that I'll add is that in those instances where these are for sale units, affordability is considered to be 120% of area median income. And knowing that area median income is 115,000, so we're going to go to 120% of that. You know, again, my, my criticism is, and I'm a strong advocate for mixed income housing. My frustration is with the state's housing policies is not meeting its own goals because of the require, you know, allowing 80% to be kind of, you can, that you get it out of jail free card for developers. So. Um, so how how could you help us message appropriately to you know we we've gotten some community members excited there like i said there has been some discussion out there about and like i said it's literally published to the public that we're saying you know a potential important component of this is the mixed income housing and there was some education that was shared out there how do we address the fact that we cannot guarantee that that will happen I think it's happening. I mean, I don't think we need to memorialize it. I mean, again, I would look at, you know, what rents are proposed at a project like like the Perkins Foundry. When I look at what a one bedroom is, um, that is going to be their market rate apartments based on what I've seen now. And it's not for me to divulge specifically what that is. But as a professional, that is not I mean, those are affordable to people at 80% of area median income, which is determined to be somebody that's moderate income by HUD standards. So it is going to happen. Um, you know, I think that, you know, one of the fears that the planning board chair had, um, and I think Mr. Dutton in his, uh, our e-newsletter yesterday addressed it, is that we shouldn't be frightened that you know, in the past, we probably shouldn't, we probably should have scrutinized 40 Bs harder than we did. Just because somebody was coming in with a 40 B didn't mean we had to accept whatever they wanted to do. 
Um, and, you know, if a 40B was going to challenge our access to infrastructure capacity, that would have been a reason to deny it. It's within the statute uh, that health and welfare of the community should be taken into those considerations. So I wasn't here for any of that, but um, I think, you know, our boards being a little bit more educated in what they can and can't do moving forward. Um, but the market will dictate where we are. But, you know, again, with respect to, and I hear from the university as well, right now we don't have a housing product for people that are young professionals or people that are seniors aging in place that want to downsize. Now, many of those seniors aging in place perhaps have been in their home for a number of years and are more financially well off than they might realize given what the housing market is. Um, so, I mean, that's a consideration. And, and, right. And and I think that's the challenge, right? So we don't have assurances and, and, and I understand why we shouldn't or could not memorialize. Like I said, I just want to make sure that this committee understands this, that our fellow counselors also understand this because we are ultimately the ones voting on this, you know, at this stage. And um, so anyway, I I welcome any thoughts, comments, reactions from, from Mr. Chase or Mr. McKinnon. Oh, Mr. Chase, I think you're on mute still, sorry. Yep. Indeed, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, thank you, Bob, for your remarks. Um, I, I think that, and, and I did attend, of course, the, uh, the joint session with the planning board, and uh, I listened to their concerns that, uh, uh, for the most part, we've actually discussed in some, at some length here again tonight. Um, I'm not so afraid of slightly increased uh, housing density uh, in the area uh, that we're speaking about, and particularly the um, what would be the Campus Plaza uh, site. Um, I know that there was a great deal of concern over the potential for uh, as, as much as a six-story uh, structure on that site. But as Mr. Ruley has pointed out again tonight, that would only come to be not along... Uh, uh, not along Broad Street itself, but it would be behind structures that would actually have frontage on uh, on Route 18. Um, personally, uh, I don't necessarily share the concern that was expressed by the planning board with respect to uh, floors five or six as um, you know, potential, uh, you know, building heights, it, it, given what we know, the fact that there are only a couple of sites where this would even be conceivable, and um, these would be structures that would be set behind um, other buildings which do have uh, frontage. Um, so I, I'm personally less concerned about that. Um, I have a feeling that in order to really sustain economic viability for a developer, um, we may need to really countenance the need for this further height. Uh, I, I think it, you know, Bob, one example that Bob pointed out previously was, um, what if a developer were to choose to have the ground level of his structure um, open for parking? In other words, rather than a subterranean parking garage uh, parking under the building. Well, of course, that would mean that uh, they're sacrificing uh, one floor of uh, otherwise rentable space. And, um, you know, I think that in a case like that, that certainly is a good example where uh, additional incentive should be available to that developer uh, to uh, recoup otherwise what, what they would be losing in that instance. Um, I, I realize that in the planning board and to some extent throughout the community, there might be a, a aversion to um, a five or six story structure. But uh, quite honestly, I don't think that it is uh, so out of scale in our town uh, in the light of a new development, uh, such as we're contemplating, uh, that it would be, uh, you know, an obvious, uh, you know, change from 
um, you know, the landscape that we're accustomed to seeing. I know that we certainly want to preserve the small town atmosphere that um, that we all cherish about Bridgewater. And I just don't know that it would uh, necessarily be uh, a bad thing, uh, given the trade-off, which is to say uh, uh, economic development and pedestrian uh, access and, uh, you know, increased housing opportunities. Um, I, I think it is something that we should be open to. Uh, that's my my personal take on that. And and I, I think the Bob's comments with respect to um, the affordability component um, makes sense because I think that Bob has rightly pointed out that um, there are economic factors that developers are going to need to consider. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we don't know, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what will be the potential interest among developers, but we have to hope that in fact, we're presenting the opportunity with the greatest latitude to them without going anything beyond what the community is willing to accept, of course. But I, I think that we're, um, in the past, I, I think that the town has had some instances of uh, uh, of thinking that have, um, uh, you know, frankly, not panned out well for the town. And uh, in retrospect, uh, should have been reconsidered. Uh, uh, you know, there was a potential development um, uh, on um, uh, on Broad Street some time ago that uh, uh, for reasons of uh, uh, the, 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 pl the planning board had found, had taken issue with certain components of it and uh, um, the developer was just not willing to reconsider those from a financial standpoint. So, I just think we need to be a little bit more open to the possibility. And that was my thinking as the planning board debated this issue and 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 still today, I can't quite move off that. I, 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 I think we need to be somewhat open to the possibility. Um, that's all I have to say on the matter. Madam Chair, may I, I appreciate, I'll, I'll I appreciate follow that. up on one point that Mr. Chase raised? The, I, can share the specific details, but I can share that there is, in fact, a purchase and sale agreement in place for the friendlies assemblage, um, which the proposed concept is completely consistent with what we're asking for in the form based code. Um, so I think that's a good sign in terms of that mm. developers are interested in that property has probably been the town's number one pain point for for some time. Um, <clears throat> I know that there's a short period of time for them to execute on the purchase and sale agreement, which I think is also positive. Um, I've had conversations with that development team and know that they're capable. We have introduced them to a local lender who is very interested in the project. So, I mean, I think we, to Mr. Chase's point, we are going to see activity in a short period of time. Um, and I think the development community's most motivating interest is that they're going to get projects approved in a timely manner, um, which I think is, is really important. I've made this point before that if we look at the three years that it's taken the Perkins Foundry project to be approved, uh, that the change in interest rates based on what that project costs now is costing that developer an additional million dollars a year in debt service. There's not a lot of developers that can stomach that kind of impact. Um, and just for your own backgrounds, there are, you know, banks right now are sitting on portfolios of distressed real estate that they haven't written off yet because it's gonna impact their balance sheets. That's gonna impact the lending market significantly moving forward. So looking how projects get financed moving forward, there's no lender that is gonna take into consideration an office component or a retail component or a restaurant component. These are gonna be financed solely on the strength of the housing component because it's just where the market is right now. So just wanted to give you that background. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, Mr. McKinnon, 
I just want I just want to echo what uh Fred said about the area and how this should be good. I mean, this is my neighborhood. I mean, Bob, you're the one that says it's not anyone's backyard, but Campus Plaza. I'm one of the four houses that it is, you know. So this would definitely be good. I'm glad to hear a PCA is in uh in the works when it comes to the friendly parking lot too, because that is uh it's one of the reasons why I ran for town council come year ago, whenever it was. Um I do have a question on the approval process. Is that going to be on the committee? I did see on a few different uh, things. That, on a few different ones of the drafts, this one said this. This one said site plan review. Is that – what are we looking at there, Bob? So the uh, – we've broken the form base code into CBDS, which is the Central Square area. So anything in the Central Square area is still going to require uh, site plan review and or special permit review by the planning board. Uh, when we get south of Main Street, Broad Street, Spring Street, Campus Plaza, Plymouth Street, uh, that is what we call CBDR. And that those projects, if somebody comes in and follows the form-based code, which is a 13-page checklist, those projects would go to a technical review committee. We've expanded what that committee is. Um, it, it was my, yeah. my office and my staff, yeah. the building official, the town engineer. Uh, it is a member of the planning board and a and member what? of the zoning board of appeals. Where yeah. necessary, we'll reach out to police and fire for their input. Um, but uh, that's typically in those communities that have a form base code. That is the approval process. If, some, if a developer comes in and does not want to follow the form-based code, that is a choice that they have, but they will have to follow the normal process with planning and or the ZBA. Um, we don't anticipate that happening because there's no advantage. You're not going to get anything more out of that than you would have if you had done the form-based code. Huh? Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, hang on. Okay. Sorry, I'm just going to mute a couple people here. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, sorry, Councillor McKinnon, anything else you want to add before I move on? No, he just cleared that up. I appreciate it, Bob. Thank you, Susie. Great. Thank you. So, Bob, if it's all right with um, with you, I'm going to go through this list from the planning board and, and just tie sure. off any kind of responses between us as well as you. Uh, so item number one, um, clarity on site plan and special permits required, adjustments to be made. Has that already happened? Have you had those separate conversations will, with the chair? Yeah, we have. And that will be, you'll see those reflected in both the red line version and the final version tomorrow. We have no, there's no objection to that. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, on the uh, transitional flex frontage, six-story buildings. Uh, on that front, I actually concur as well. Um, I I don't have concerns. I think that the way that it's proposed is certainly um, reasonable, and particularly in the spaces that we're talking about. It's it's um, and you know, um, I appreciate the explanation that you had shared earlier, and actually in, in several meetings. Um, and then actually that is where we get the additional ability to have some restricted income housing um, as part of that development. So I think that's actually very important. Um, the other detail here around max footprint of up to 25,000 square feet and their recommendation of reducing that to 16,000. Um, I actually have mentioned to the chair as well that I don't fully agree with this. Um, I come. From, I've spent a long time in retail and actually opened up twenty five thousand square foot stores, and I know how small they are. Um, so I don't know if any of the other counselors have any comments on on that particular detail or or any concern. None from me, Susie. Okay, Madam Chair, um, is that, with respect to that, um, I I think we're in theory we agree with um, what the planning board was trying to do with the exception of the campus plaza site and uh, potentially the spring street lot because some of these other lots aren't big enough that that it's even an issue so i mean we're we're not fighting that at all i mean you know that i'll defer to you and your other colleagues on the council as to 
how you want to treat that. But uh, from my office's perspective, we can go either way on that with the caveat that we would allow more flexibility on those larger sites. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, item number three um, was around minimum lot size or frontage indicated since, can you help explain this a little bit? Uh, I know, and I apologize, I know you have before as well, but um, I think I got a little lost on that. So it so their comment is newly created lots require 10,000 square feet. No minimum lot frontage for existing non-conforming lots. Um, new lots require 100 feet. So would appreciate your perspective on yeah, this. Yeah, so one. I mean, and again, um, this really, I mean, we've identified right now, we know there are five or six likely development sites. Um, the idea is, and particularly on Broad Street, is that we want to create a consistent street edge. So we want buildings to front the sidewalk for as far as we can, with the exception of whatever ingress and egress we need for the sites. Um, because we don't have standard lot sizes, we need a little bit of flexibility. But the idea was we didn't want to have somebody that had 100 feet of frontage put a building in that only had 25 feet because now we're still keeping open gaps. We want to have a more, we want to extend what the central square downtown feels like down Broad Street. Mm -hmm. And whatever, and we've talked about, you know, developing Campus Plaza to be more of a village center or town center, you want that to have the feel of a downtown as well. So you want to, you know, keep those buildings as close together, close to the street, whether that be Spring Street or Broad Street, as you can, with the idea that you're probably going to have some new interior private roads within that site. So you want to kind of frame that like a neighborhood or a downtown, if you would. Mm -hmm. So is that more around the frontage or is that? Yeah, it's is... the frontage. Yeah, so what it's about the, the along the frontage? Lot So what about minimum lot size? Do we not have a requirement for that? Or why don't we have a requirement? I, I prefer it to be uh, on a case-by-case -case basis because some of these lots are configured and you know, they're not rectangles, they're not squares. Um, so we need some flexibility. Um, I've asked our consultants, um, they're looking at making a recommendation before tomorrow morning as to whether they think that's reasonable or not. So you'll see uh, either that reflected as a red line in the changes made, or I'll offer a comment why we don't think we should be doing that. And again, I'll defer to the council to ultimately weigh in on that. And, and before I lose my thought on that, if this is approved by the council on Tuesday night, the document still has to go to the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities to be approved. Um, they very well might come back and say, we need to see these changes um, because we have to meet the requirements of the MBTA communities. We think we are fairly certain we're meeting the compliance requirements, but I just want to say that even if the council approves this on Tuesday, it still needs one more layer of review at, at the, the state level. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, just going to take a quick beat there. Any questions from anyone else? No. No. Okay. Uh, item number four, we already discussed around the um, affordable mixed income piece. Item number five. Um, so this one, I definitely got lost in the joint meeting. Uh, I wasn't sure where we fully landed. Um, the board would like to see, the, the, the planning board would like to see some language that ensures commercial development occupy the first floor buildings in their entirety and not allow for residential units on the ground. Um, and it feels like that there's probably some flexibility that's built into the form-based code to not make it so prescriptive. Um, um, I think the language needs to be a little clearer. I mean, we certainly want to see commercial retail restaurant uses on the ground floor level um, and not residential. Uh, our consultants felt that 
given the current economic market that in the short term, it might be difficult to fill that space. And therefore, um, you might want a property owner to say, I'll temporarily have that residential. So the design requirements are that it have a ceiling height that would be uh, consistent with retail commercial spaces. I don't necessarily have that fear. I think that um, as a result of the Perkins <laughs> project going forward, uh, based on what I know in terms of interest uh, with the Pascal site and the commercial retail space there, uh, potential for a restaurant there, talking to other property owners. I, I think that this is, if we build it, they will come. Um, you know, we're not talking about initially 100,000 square feet of retail space. Um, we're talking about uh, retail space that could be from local businesses, regional businesses, or local restaurants expanding, or you know, we're not going to see chain restaurants, I don't think, coming in national chain restaurants coming and taking some of the space. So um, my preference is, is that, you know, we hold to that. We want commercial retail office on those ground floors. You want that space to be lit up. Now that could be because it's the rental office or it could be the fitness center for, for a building that's mixed use that has residential above, but it's important that there's, people in those buildings and those buildings seem like they're occupied and are not residential. And then that really, again, only applies to the CBDR, not the, not the central square area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions on that front folks? I mean, no, I don't really have a question, but one thing I would like to see with all this form based code and all that, when, when it comes to commercial, if it has frontage on the street, it would be nice to see that part of that building definitely be commercial. Like Bob said, it's not really the time to fill out every first floor with commercial, but it definitely would be nice to see if it has street frontage or commercial on the first floor. That, that's an automatic. I mean, that, that that's in the code now. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Okay. Um, item six, the... The technical, what's the TCR? I'm like looking over. Technical oh, technical review committee. review committee. Oh, that's that's just a typo. Um, um, I was like, wait, it's a TRC, not the TCR. Anyway, technical review committee. Um, there was a request, and and actually, this is something I'd flagged as well, to make sure that we had uh representation from planning board and ZBA, and it looks like in the latest amendment that that has been added. That's correct. We've added that. Um. And then item seven, the zoning map to just capture latest zoning. Like it sounds like that's what they just said. We've revised that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and that was it from their notes. So I would ask at this time, is there anything else about the form based code that we would like to ask Mr. Rooley? <laughs> no. Nothing. Okay. Um, I think then, um, we would probably want to, um, entertain a motion to recommend this ordinance. I'll, Is that I'll, make, an, <laughs> I'll make a uh, motion to recommend to the town council. Just a, a, a point of order, uh, if I may, uh, are we, are we recommending the uh, specific proposals uh, as we've just gone through that were suggested by the planning board or are we modifying any of those proposals, uh, any of those specifics in accord with remarks that we might have made this evening, uh, yeah. such as building height? So, um, sorry, thank you for, for helping to educate me on this, since this is my second meeting I've run like this. Um, I think for number one, that's already, those edits have already been done, so that will be reflected in, in the next version. I think for number two, we actually, it feels like we are actually in disagreement with the recommendation around reducing to four stories or reducing the, the footprint. So that would remain um, the language that's already in the form-based code. So there's no changes there. 
Uh, number three, uh, the frontage piece. Um, I think, again, we're not recommending to follow this recommendation from the planning board. And so the, the, the code would remain the same. Uh, same thing with number four, uh, that there was an amendment already made. Um, and that is in that provision for um, the density bonus. If it goes up to six stories, that's where the 10% restricted income um, units would be required. Uh, number five, Bob, help me. Is there, was there an amendment done there of any kind? Don't have an Which number five was which one? Oh, sorry, about commercial occupancy of the first floor buildings. Yeah, we're going to make sure that the language is specific, that it is it is a requirement. We don't want the flexibility to have it potentially be residential because I, I think the market is coming back to us that there's going to not be a need for that. And these projects aren't all going to come online at the same time. And I think as they come online, there's going to be interest generated. And yeah. I just anecdotally, I'll share that a business owner and property owner in proximity to the friendly site, you know, commented to me, well, if that's going to happen, I might just tear down my building and put up a new one, um, which wouldn't be the worst thing that happened. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and then six was already updated, and that was about the TRC Technical Review Committee members, and then the zoning map um, yeah. illustration that's already in, in progress as well. So it looks like the only... Sorry, it looks like the only thing that will change will be the amendment for item five, which is around ensuring commercial development occupy the first floor. So I think with that piece, we're in agreement and we would recommend to the town council to um, accept the ordinance with that, that amendment. Uh, I would uh, I would second that motion then. Great. Uh, do I need to do a roll call vote? <laughs> yeah, you should, do, you should do a roll call vote. Okay, vote. I'm gonna do a roll call vote. <laughs> Councillor Chase? Yes. Councillor McKinnon? Yes. And I am also a yes. So three, three to zero, um, the motion passes. Okay, I'm gonna move thank on. Thank you to very much. I, uh, thank you, Bob. I'm going to now make you the host as a parting gift. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to share my screen for anything, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to move on to the next piece of uh, legislation. It is item DB, proposed zoning ordinance DFY24-003, chapter 7.7, .7, specialized energy code. So this is um, uh, a, a proposed zoning ordinance. Um, introduced by uh, the council president, Mr. Moore. And um, I'm going to, should I read the whole, th no, I'm not gonna read the whole thing. Do I need to read the whole thing? Well, I uh, should probably read it, right? <laughs> Officially? Well, I, I, I would imagine uh, someone might need to hear it, so. Okay. Uh, so again, proposed zoning ordinance DFY 24-003, chapter 7.7, .7, specialized energy code, whereas in accordance with the provisions of section 2-6 of the Bridgewater Home Rule Charter relative to amendments to the town ordinance, it is therefore ordered that the town council assembled votes to amend the Bridgewater Zoning Ordinance Section 7 special regulations to add section 7.7 .7 specialized energy code as follows and to be effective July 1, 2024. And the definitions for 7.7.1, International Energy Conservation Code. Um, the International Energy Conservation Code is a building energy code created by the International Code Council. It is a model code adopted by many state and municipal governments in the United States for the establishment of minimum design and construction requirements for energy efficiency and is updated on a three-year cycle. The baseline energy conservation requirements of the Mass State Building Code are the IECC with Massachusetts amendments 
as approved by the Board of Building Reg Regulations and Standards and published in state regulations as part of 780 CMR. Specialized Energy Code, codified by the entirety of 225 CMR 22 and 23, including appendices RC and CC. The Specialized Energy Code adds residential and commercial appendices to the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Stretch Energy Code based on amendments to the respective net zero appendices of the International Energy Conservation Code, the IECC, to incorporate the energy efficiency of the stretch energy code and further reduce the climate impacts of buildings built to this code with the goal of achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions from the building sector no later than 2050. The next definition is stretch energy code codified by the combination of 225 CMR 22 and 23, one, not including appendices RC and CC, the Stretch Energy Code is a comprehensive set of amendments to the International Energy Conservation Code, IECC, uh, seeking to achieve all life cycle cost-effective energy efficiency in accordance to the Green Com uh, Communities Act of 2008, as well as to reduce the climate impacts of buildings built to this code. 7.7.2 purpose. The purpose of 225 CMR 22.00 and 23.00, including appendices RC and CC, also referred to as the Specialized Energy Code, is to provide a more energy efficient and low greenhouse gas emissions alternative to the stretch energy code or the baseline Massachusetts energy code applicable to the relevant sections of the building code for new construction and existing buildings. 7.7.3 applicability. This energy code applies to residential and commercial buildings. 7.7.4 specialized code. The specialized code, as codified by the entirety of 225 CMR 22 and 23, including appendices RC and CC, including any future additions, amendments, or modifications. The specialized code is enforceable by the inspector of buildings or building commissioner. Explanation. The Climate Act of 2021 required the development of a new municipal opt-in specialized energy code, which is a specialized code. The statute requires that the specialized code is formulated to ensure new construction that is consistent with Massachusetts greenhouse gas limits and sublimits set every five years from 2025 to 2050. The specialized code consists of the IECC 2021 with Massachusetts specific amendments plus additional stretch code and specialized code amendments. Communities may opt into the special, specialized code. For new residential construction, the specialized code requires the following above and beyond the stretch code. Bullet one, mixed fuel homes 4,000 square feet or under must, number one, be pre-wired for electrification and number two, install on-site solar PV when following the stretch code HERS pathway with an exemption for shaded sites. The next bullet is mixed fuel homes over 4,000 square feet must, bullet one, achieve HERS zero or PHIUS zero requirements and be pre-wired for electrification and install on-site solar PV or other renewables to achieve the zero energy building definition. For new commercial construction, the specialized code requires the following above and beyond the stretch code. Mixed fuel buildings must be pre-wired for electrification and install on-site solar PV of a minimum of 1.5 watts per square feet for each square foot of the three largest floors or for 75% of the potential solar zone and meet minimum HVAC equipment and service water heating efficiencies. All multi-family buildings over 12,000 square feet must achieve pre-certification to passive house standards. And I think that is it. Well done. Thank you. That was a mouthful. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I know that Mr. Hunt has presented. It's been a few months 
So this was put together. The first reading was issued um, uh, November 21st of 2023. I know that Mr. Hunt had come before us um, advocating for this. Um, and um, do we have any questions or discussion? I just had a couple of, uh, you know, very brief comments, I think. Um, I think what, what people need to understand most importantly about this is that um, um, Bridgewater is already uh, has already accepted the the stretch energy code, and as you can see by the the title of this proposed legislation, this is specifically dealing with the so-called specialized energy code. Um, so for some period of time, some number of years, I'm not even sure quite how long, but we have adopted. Firstly, the stretch energy code, um, which was required um, in order for the town to achieve status as a green community uh, under the Green Communities Act of 2008. And uh, what many of us in town uh, will understand and, and remember is that there have been a number of projects uh, that... Um, have been undertaken here in the town with funding provided uh, for which we as a town were eligible by virtue of being a green community. So things like, you know, LED uh, you know, uh, street lights and, and uh, um, a, a number of others. Certainly when we, when we renovated the Academy building some years ago, uh, it was made very uh, uh, energy efficient in order to make the town eligible for um, you know, further funding for other projects down the road. So this was all coming about by way of the stretch energy code. So the what is before us now is the, the specialized energy code that um, you, you described by the legislation, uh, the language of the legislation. And what I think is most important for people to understand about it is that it, it, is, it is largely, in fact, I'll say almost entirely applicable only to new construction, new residential and new commercial construction. Yes, it's true that in some cases, if an existing uh, residence or other building, you know, were to um, undergo, uh, uh, you know, a large scale renovation, you know, adding on a, uh, you know, a room or a wing or something like that. Yes, that could invoke further uh, compliance requirements under the specialized code. But for the most part, the specialized code is only directed toward um, new construction. And uh, that goes, uh, certainly your comments that you had read uh, just a moment ago, Susie, uh, highlight that, uh, the section mm -hmm. for, for new residential construction and for new commercial construction. And some of what the requirements would include would be um, providing for um, at least the capability of, of future um, electrification, uh, whether it's in connection with electrical heating and cooling systems or um, recharge uh, stations for electric vehicles, things of that sort. So I think it's safe to say that, you know, for the vast majority of residents of Bridgewater, um, there is not uh, likely any immediate and maybe not even any long-term uh, change to what we do uh, in our homes as a result of this uh, legislation, uh, because it is so heavily directed toward new construction. And as you did point out, Susie, it's uh, all part of a state um mandate to meet a goal of um, um, a 50% uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions uh, from the 1990 baseline uh, by 2030. So just, just a mere six years away. Mm -hmm. um, there are, uh, uh, I've forgotten now and I had it before me, if I see it, the number of towns who have already adopted uh, this legislation, and um, um, I, I see 20, as of December 5th of 2023, 
29 cities and towns have adopted this, which is this municipal opt-in specialized energy code. Um, what, um, what makes it simple for us in our role is that there is, if we choose to opt in by virtue of council approval, uh, there's nothing else we need to consider because frankly, there's no opportunity for us to modify any provisions of this mm. um, because it's um, it's all very carefully laid out in state regulations. Uh, I have copies of those and have given them at least uh, a, a review of all the sections I felt important to become familiar with. And um, I I have to say that I'm I'm favorable toward the legislation. Uh, I think that it is important for us to consider this as a uh, an important milestone uh certainly for our community and in the larger picture for the commonwealth overall uh toward uh, minimizing uh, uh greenhouse gas emissions uh within a short number of years uh, that's all i have um thank you mr chase that's really helpful context um I will admit I'm a little disadvantaged on a couple of these technical terms, um, but broadly, um, you know, for instance, the on-site solar PV when following the stretch code hers pathway, like that's that's a bit beyond my pay grade. But uh, one of the, uh, in, fundamentally, you know, in theory, this feels like the right thing to do. Um, what my only question, and I wonder, and I don't know if we have that answer, especially knowing that only 29 out of 351 cities and towns in the Commonwealth have opted into this, is is this a deterrent for developers? Because it certainly feels like it costs more, right? I um, speak that note right there with my all my years of construction. I've worked on her zero. I've worked on hers 55 buildings. Oh, good. It's not just you're going from two by fours to two by sixes and all this. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm a no on this to recommend it. I am. This is going to increase all new buildings in our town, commercial and residential, without without a doubt. Um, I'm for people having solar panels. I was also for and that those can be a pain. It's good. It's good for the world. It's good for the environment. I am for people. If they want solar or any of this, go ahead. I don't think all these new buildings that are, should go up should have to be wired into it. I mean, it's it's going to make houses at least 50,000 more, in my opinion. We, we can look, do more research in that. Maybe my number's wrong, but I, I'm just, I'm not for this. I'm usually for things that Mr. Hunt puts forward, but this I'm a no on. Mm. Thank you for that perspective. I think you, I think I really, actually, I really appreciate that you have that hands-on perspective around, um, you know, from the builder side. Um, so, it, and, and Mr. Chase, hopefully you can guide me here. Mr. Hunt does have his hand raised. <laughs> Is he allowed to participate in this discussion? I... We could vote to allow it, I believe, right? We. Oh, okay. And then I... Yeah, I'd like to put a motion on, on the floor to, to allow Mr. Hunt to join our discussion. I would second that. Uh, me uh, also. Okay. Uh, roll call real quick. Councilor Chase? Yes. Councilor McKinnon? Yes. And I am a yes. Mr. Hunt, please go ahead. Thank you for that uh, support. Um, I want to bring a couple of other things out. Uh, number one, the master plan, 2022 master plan policy 8721 is a commitment to environmental sustainability in all of town bridge water policies. Accepting this would actually meet that goal. Uh, Fred has done a very nice job of explaining what it is. Uh, I believe in some of the documentation that I sent folks uh, has a listing of the expected cost this might have for developers, et cetera. And it isn't as much as was mentioned a moment ago. It's actually a positive. You think about this. It's a positive, not in the short term, maybe the cost to install, but the long term savings of cost, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, has was far outweighs anything. If you don't do it, 
you're going to end up paying in another way. So uh, that's my main point uh, for this. And I think uh, specialized code is designed to go to net zero. Another term you may or may not be familiar with is a passive house. The PFIS, regu uh, regulations, et cetera, international regulations have been instituted in Bridgewater. The McCowan's new building in the back is the most energy efficient building in the state of Massachusetts. Having more, and especially with what's going on with the uh, farm based code, having that requirement will actually improve significantly, I think, the saleability and the uh, economics of those buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Um, I'm actually looking at um, a Q&A that had been shared with us um, from the Mass Department of Energy um, Resources. And there is a, a cost and savings table um, later on in the document. Um, Does Carl speak again? Or is this hand just stuck up? I don't know. Mr. Hunt, are you still? Okay. Oh, oh, he's good. He's good. Just making sure he didn't have to say anything else. Yeah, thanks. Any any other discussion or, or questions? None from me. No. Okay. Um, so we do need to vote on a recommendation, correct? That's right. Okay. Um, I will put a motion on the floor to recommend to the town council. Can I get I a second? I would second that. Okay. Uh, roll call vote. Mr. Chase? Yes. Mr. McKinnon? No. I'm actually going to be an abstain on this one. So we have uh, one yes, one no, and one abstain. So we'll record that and um, bring that rec bring those results back to our fellow counselors for further discussion. Okay. All right, there is no other business on the agenda. Um, I would like to call for an adjournment of the meeting. Can I put a motion on the floor to adjourn? And I'll make sure. Okay. Roll call vote. Mr. Chase? Yes. Mr. McKinnon? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who joined with us tonight. Thank you for listening and being active. And everyone have a great night. Have a good night. All right. You too. Yeah. Bye.